go from the extremely local, and we're going to zoom right back out again to uh, the continental. Um, so I'd, I'd like to share some very uh, hot off the press results um, from some work that's ongoing within the malaria atlas project, mainly based here in Oxford, um, on modelling the changing landscape of malaria control, infection and disease in sub-Saharan Africa since the year 2000. So just a bit of background. Since its inception in 2005, um, the Malaria Atlas Project, I guess, has primarily been known for the, for the generation of these global risk maps um, for both PF and, and more recently for PV. These are cross-sectional maps of risk, so they're tied to a specific target year. Um, and the most recent iteration uh, is this one for 2010. So back in 2012, we embarked on a new project um, that essentially uh, aims to extend these approaches into the spatial-temporal domain. So to go from static evaluations of risk to dynamic evaluations. Um, with an initial focus on Sub-Saharan Africa and PF, um, the, this project is essentially geared up to try and answer three central questions. First, how has the pattern of endemicity changed in Sub-Saharan Africa since the year 2000? What have been the implications of this change on clinical incidents, i.e. on disease burden? And how do those patterns of change relate to the heter heterogeneous uh, background pattern of control efforts, with an initial emphasis primarily on insecticide-treated bed nets? So over the past 24 months, we've been building the data and the modeling architectures needed to address these questions. And I'm pleased to be able to share some initial results from the project. Um, so essentially, my, my task now is to, is to condense about two years of work into about eight minutes. Um, so forgive the fact that the, the description of methods is, is extremely schematic, and the presentation of results is, is essentially just to give you a flavor um, of where some of this is going. But hopefully, I, I can convey the essence of what we're trying to do here. So the analysis is structured into three interlinked components. And the first of those focuses on generating the, the richest possible description of the evolving spatiotemporal pattern of bed net coverage. So we start with data, and we've got data from around about 100 uh, national surveys that ask questions about bed net coverage in a standardized way. Um, they're all geo-referenced. We also include data from um, national malaria control programs on the number of nets distributed and on the manufacturers of nets in terms of how many nets are delivered to countries within, within a given year. Um, and we include various spatial covariates as well. It's actually a two-stage modeling process. So the first thing we do is build a Bayesian compartmental time series model. So we're trying to get the national trend in ITN coverage right continuously through time. And then we, in a second stage, we use a spatiotemporal geostatistical model which essentially then aims to, to fill in the, the spatial heterogeneity subnationally once we know the national average. And the outcome from that um, is a, what we call a cube, a spatial temporal cube or a dynamic map of bed net coverage since the year 2000 with a notional resolution of five kilometers. So these are the kind of results that we can get out. This is the year 2000, and we're plotting here um, uh, insecticide treated bed net coverage between 0% which is the dark red colors, and 100%. And here we are in the year 2000, so for ITN's coverage is essentially zero. As we start to progress through the decade, and I'll go through to 2005 and, and pause there momentarily, uh, at this point we're seeing that coverage remains overall extremely low. Many countries haven't begun any kind of major implementation of bed net programs. Um, but for a few early implementers, we might call them, um, Kenya, Tanzania, Zambia, for example, and East Africa, um, the Gambia, other places in West Africa, they're starting to creep up in terms of coverage in the 20s and 30%. Um, just, just to define that metric, that means 20 to 30% of the population sleeping under a net on the night before the survey. So this is a, a, a coverage metric of use. So we go a bit further on. Um, 2006 and 7, 8, 9, 10, I'll take it right the way through to 2012, which is the most recent year that we've, we've done this for so far. And you can see that the landscape of coverage is utterly transformed since the beginning of the decade. Um, the overall average level is 49% of adults sleeping under a bed net the night before. Um, so about 50% of populations at risk, which is, corresponds to the kind of yellow colors in the middle of that range. But you can see there's, there's not one single narrative that explains what's been happening. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very complicated and diverse tapestry. Every country, every sub-national region has its own time series, its, its own story. And things don't just move in one direction. We don't just have a monotonic increase. Places scale up, they have a mass uh, distribution campaign, 
and that maybe not, is not renewed quick enough and you see a decline in coverage. So, so there's an enormous amount going on um, and certainly more than I, than I can kind of comment on as we go through. But the key message is some countries and some subnational regions are much further ahead and others are lagging well behind. So the second stage um, is to move on to the modeling of infection prevalence, the metric we call PFASIPRAM parasite rate, PFPR, simply the proportion of the population in a cross-sectional sense that are infected at a given point in time. Here we bring to bear um, the, the, the large databases that we maintain in the Malaria Atlas project on uh, PFPR surveys, each of which we know its location and we also know its, its time point. And we have about 22,000 of those for sub-Saharan Africa since the year 2000. Again, we also bring in information from spatial and spatial temporal covariates. And then importantly, we link that to the, to the output from that first stage, this continuous cube of ITN coverage. And we bring these into what is actually now quite a complicated spatial temporal geostatistical modeling framework to generate our second major output, which is a continuous cube of parasite rate. Again, a dynamic map, five kilometer resolution since the year 2000. So the metric now uh, is PFPR, so the proportion of children aged 2 to 10, that's our, our standardized age range, um, the percentage of those who have a patent PFALCIPRAM infection. So the blues are 0% all the way up to the reds, 100%. And here we are in the year 2000. Um, so this is an era with essentially almost zero meaningful intervention coverage, certainly in terms of insecticide-treated nets. And the, the geographical pattern at the large scale uh, that determines risk is essentially linked to the underlying environmental suitability for transmission. So again, we'll fast forward through our model outputs to 2005, the midpoint of the decade. What we're starting to see, if we refer back to that insecticide-treated net coverage map, um, is those countries which we're, we're calling early implementers, and I'm going to just flick forward and back so your eyes can, can see the difference in pattern. So back to 2004. If you keep your eyes on places like Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia, in the West, Senegal, the Gambia, we're seeing significant advances in terms of the reduction of infection prevalence, even by 2005. In other places, we're seeing almost, almost no progress whatsoever, and that corresponds to the fact that they haven't, at this point, had any significant scale-up of, of the major vector control interventions. Go forward another couple of years to 2007. This is the kind of peak kind of inequity in, in, in transmission intensity through the decade that we're seeing. So again, countries are really, some countries are really forging ahead now and having major impacts on their transmission intensity, and others look just as they did in 2000. And often this can happen between immediate neighbors, seeing very stark boundaries between different countries. So I'll move forward now to the, to the last years of the decade and, and back up to 2012 again. And I think this is really one of the most kind of exciting outputs of this work so far. What you'll see is that we're starting to see a real acceleration in some of these declines. Um, Countries that have been implementing these programs for a long time are achieving extremely low coverage. But what's most encouraging is, is the suggestion, at least, that what would traditionally be called the kind of heartland of, of high transmission, so large swathes of West Africa, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, do now appear also to be catching up. We know that insecticide bed net uh, ITN coverage is, is, is ramping up in the last few years, um, and that appears to be being translated into meaningful declines in, in transmission intensity. There's many caveats associated with this. Um, I'm not showing you here the uncertainty intervals that we do generate as part of this work. Um, obviously, when we have lots of empirical data, where we've just had a national survey, we can generate very, very precise estimates. As we, become, as we come further away in, in a given country, when the most recent survey becomes more and more in the distant past, the uncertainty intervals grow, and the reliance on some of the inherent assumptions and structures of the model, going back to some of the things Chris was saying at the beginning, the reliance becomes heavier. Um, in the next few weeks, we're eagerly anticipating the release of the 2013 um, national survey for the DRC, which includes paracetamia testing in under fives. Our hope is that this confirms that the currently largely model-based projection that we've seen these, these significant declines in that really, really important country, um, but that will be confirmed and the, the model will be improved and made more robust when those data come in. And that's the ongoing story. This work is, is a continual process where new data can feed in and update the map and make our estimates more precise. So the third and final stage um, is to, to focus on that final metric of interest, clinical incidence, so the disease morbidity from malaria. Um, and we, the idea is that we can um, 
take our continuous cube of parasite rate and infer what that means in terms of clinical incidence. And to do that, we need to have a model that converts between these two metrics so that it can predict incidence as a function of observed or predicted prevalence. First of all, we need data to parameterize that model. So we, we go out and, and, and do an assembly of all the data that we can find, and it's not particularly abundant, um, where people have measured clinical incidence in the community at the same time as measuring parasite rate. There's about 36 sites which have sufficient quality data um, to inform that. Then we need to build a model, and there's um, significant disagreement or absence of consensus about the exact functional form of this key relationship between infection prevalence and clinical incidence. So rather than kind of putting all our eggs in one basket and relying on one single model, we take a leaf out of the, the book of climate science and say, well, let's try and make a, a, an ensemble of the, of the main models that are out there and use them in a combined way to estimate the form of this relationship. So we bring together models from the three sort of major groups doing this kind of mechanistic modeling work um, at Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute, at Imperial College, and at the in at Institute of Disease Modeling at Intellectual Ventures over in Seattle. We add a fourth model, which is our own um, fairly sophisticated empirical approach to capturing the same relationship. So these relationships are structured by age and by um, high and low seasonality. This is just one of those eight potential panels that we, that we generate. And with this um, ensemble envelope in hand, what we can then do is take the parasite rate cube and we can propagate it in a, in a probabilistic way through this relationship, capturing all the, the inherent uncertainties in it and generate, finally, our, our third cube, our third dynamic map of interest, which is one of clinical incidence rate. So I'm not going to kind of commentate all the way through this one as, as I did before, um, but the, the metric that we have now um, is the number of cases per 1,000 people per year. In, in this particular case, we're showing the incidence across all ages, but we can also stratify by age. Um, again, for the year 2000, and as I go through the decade, you'll see how this reduces. There's some important implications in terms of the, the form of that relationship between clinical incidence and parasite rate. It's non-linear. Um, what that translates into is that significant gains in reducing infection prevalence don't necessarily translate into proportional decreases in clinical incidence. So we can have measured progress. There are less people infected, but the number of disease cases that that pool of infectious people generates doesn't improve as rapidly. Um, and that's an important kind of mathematical but very practical um, implication that needs to be kind of understood. So I'll, I'll just quickly run through the, through the deck. So 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. You can see the, the pattern shrinking in a broadly similar way to infection prevalence. But what we can then do is put hard numbers on, on that map so we can um, underlay the cube with an equivalent uh, high resolution but evolving cube of population density that becomes our denominator. We can multiply that by our clinical incidence rates, and we can calculate hard numbers, of the actual number of cases per country per year, and we can examine the trends in that. So that's a very brief whistle-stop tour of this, of this little project and some initial results. Just to briefly acknowledge my team, who are mostly here, um, the wider C group, um, colleagues at the WHO, uh, and other academic groups around the world, our funders, um, and all those uh, contributors of data to the Malaria Atlas project.